Therefore, I want all I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Rejoice the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. It's great to be with you this morning. And I want to thank Randy for the excellent Bible class this morning on the book of Hebrews. We talked about men and women of faith from Hebrews chapter 11. And we're told in chapter 12 that since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And uh, thank you, Jerry, for those wonderful songs that we've been singing this morning, giving praise and honor to God, reminding us of what an awesome God we serve. Thank you, Bill, for the prayer uh, done in the name of Jesus, reminding us that we do have a wonderful God and that we can approach his throne of grace and that's what we're going to be talking about in just a little while. And thanks to whoever makes a communion bread. I love the communion bread here. I don't know if it's appropriate to say that or not, <laughs> but the only place where the communion bread is as good as it is at King's Orchard is at the Washougal Church of Christ in Washougal, Washington. Because the person who makes communion bread there got the recipe from the person that makes communion bread here. And I want you to know the people in Washougal thank you for the communion bread. And uh, thanks uh, for the thoughts uh, at the table. Uh, thanks, Ken, uh, for leading us in those thoughts and the prayers, reminding us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Before I get into the lesson this morning, I do need to say a few words about Churches of Christ disaster relief effort. I think most of us, most of you are familiar with this program. Oh, by the way, my name is Dale Lindsay. Uh, I uh, work with Churches of Christ disaster relief effort, and we've been, I've been working with it since 2014. And when I travel to different churches, I like to tell people one of the things I like about this work is that I get to take my wife with me. And then I say, and we just got married. <laughs> now, you know we got married 44 years ago, but a lot of people don't know that. And they go, oh, how sweet. And then I say, yeah, 44 years ago. <laughs> but um, it's been a, a delight to work with this uh, ministry because what we do is we send out supplies to victims of major disasters such as hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, fires, those types of things, natural disasters. And we also send out supplies to places where they've had some, what you would call man-made disasters. And in the foyer, there's some yellow bags that I've left with you and there's some information in there about this work so that you can read up about it and learn more. You can visit our website, disasterrelief.effort.org. If you want to keep up with us in terms of where's the latest place we've been to help, I recommend, recommend going to our Facebook page. But what I've learned is that not everybody does Facebook. And that's okay. In fact, you'll probably be a better Christian if you don't. Can I say that? <laughs> but, but if you want to know where we've been on a more recent date, uh, go to our Facebook page. So recently, of course, we've been sending water, that's right, water, just water, to East Palestine, Ohio. Most of you are familiar with what, with what took place there. There was a <coughs> tragic train re, uh, derailment. Uh, a lot of uh, chemicals were put into the uh, system and uh, they're not sure how clean the water is, so they're requesting water. And there's a church that's only 10 miles away from where that took place, and they are distributing the water. We work with local churches of Christ. We keep our supplies in Nashville, Tennessee. Our volunteers come to the warehouse, they get on the assembly line, and they put boxes of food together, cleaning supplies, rakes, shovels, 
all sorts of things. And many of you have seen what's on the truck because you've helped on more than one occasion. You helped in 2014 in Pateras. You helped just a few years ago when there was a fire here. And we thank you so much for your help. So the only thing that I would ask you to remember is this address, and I'm gonna give it to you, and please memorize it. 410 Allied Drive, Nashville, Tennessee. Can you say that with me? 410 Allied Drive, Nashville, Tennessee. I love that audience participation. Now you're asking, preacher, why do I need to know 410 Allied Drive, Nashville, Tennessee? Well, because that's where our warehouse is. And everybody visits Nashville sometime in their life. You got to go to Nashville to listen to all those amazing country western singers or to visit uh, churches back there. Uh, but while you're there, go to. Now call them before you go. Please call them before you go. Uh, one of our reps told people go and they, he didn't say call them before you go and they just showed up. But if you do call before you go, they might have some work for you to do as well. And you can help. Since 1991, we've sent out about $175 million worth of supplies to disaster victims. Now, a lot of times people ask, well, what can we do? What can we do? Well, of course, you can do what you've been doing, and that is help when there is a disaster. Thank you very much. You can help by supporting the work of disaster relief effort. There's a lot of good works to support. Uh, we just helped one just a few minutes ago. Uh, Lifeline, what a beautiful work that is, and this congregation has been doing it for what? 15 years, I think? A long time. Thank you, that's a good work. But we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared for us in advance to do. That's all part of God's plan of salvation. The other thing you can do is to pray. Pray for this work, pray for other works, pray for all sorts of needs. So let's talk about prayer this morning. First Timothy, I believe that First Timothy, Second Timothy, and the book of Titus kind of give us a big picture of God's plan for the church, the organization of the church, what needs to be taught, what Timothy and Titus need to focus on in their ministry. For example, Timothy is told in or Timothy is told in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Timothy, preach the word. That's your main task. Focus on the public reading of scripture, preaching, and teaching. And then, of course, there's more instructions given in 1 Timothy chapter 3 regarding the organization of the church and the kind of leaders that God wants when Paul tells Timothy the qualifications or the characteristics, the qualities of elders and deacons. And one of the things we see in 1 Timothy is this emphasis on prayer. That's part, a very important part, of God's plan and his picture for the church. And I think we need to be thankful for instructions on prayer. You know, every year in November, we celebrate Thanksgiving, don't we? And I think, well, I like Fourth of July too. But I really like Thanksgiving because I know it's hard for the women because they work so hard. And if men would just get their heads on straight and help out, that would be a good thing. But we like to sit down and have a wonderful meal together, perhaps with friends and family. But when you think of Thanksgiving, it's really all about God, giving him thanks. And our first president even said so in, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm hitting it the wrong way. I was hitting it backwards. I got to go forwards. Where do I point this? There it is. Okay, October 3rd, 1789, George Washington issued this Thanksgiving proclamation. And notice the number of times that uh, the president talks about God and, and how we're to give him the thanks. He says, by the president of the United States of America, a proclamation, 
Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and what? And prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend and aside Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for this kind care and protection of the people of the country previous to their becoming a nation. We're going to pause for just a second. Brother Bertram is helping us out. Do I just press? Is this what they call Murphy's Law? It was off, but it seems to be dead. Oh, oh, I turned. You know what I did? I didn't turn it on. <laughs> Let's try it now. There it is. Yes, please give me a hand. Thank you very much. All right. Now, Bruce, that was not Bruce's fault. Just so you know, that was Dale's fault. I did, he told me to turn it on. Okay. Uh, so let's be thankful for prayer. Revival, someone has said revival is always preceded by prayer. If we want God to do great things in us, it starts with prayer. And there are a lot of people in the Bible that were men and women of prayer. Maybe you've got your favor. A lot of people like uh, Anna the prophetess in Luke chapter 2. It tells us that she just kept on praying. She just kept on praying. And then there's, of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about uh, Daniel. But there's so many great examples of men and women of prayer in the Bible. And Nehemiah is one of them. Nehemiah was a praying man. And let's do this little uh, Bible history review. Remember that Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians in 586 BC. The Persians conquered Babylon in 539 BC. And in 538 BC, this guy by the name of Cyrus, who was the king of Persia, issued a decree for the Israelites to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem because it had been destroyed. And we read about that in Ezra chapter 1. But then Nehemiah discovered the people had not done the work that God had commissioned them to do. So what did Nehemiah do? Well, he did not throw a fit at the people. He did not start a program to fix things. He did not complain and criticize. He sat down and wept. He mourned, he fasted, and he prayed before God. He was a man of prayer. So look at Nehemiah chapter 1 where it tells us, Some men from Judah came and I asked them about the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and disgrace. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now the Bible doesn't tell us how many days he wept and mourned. It doesn't tell us how many days that he was fasting and praying. But we do know that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. And in his prayer, Nehemiah did three things. First, he praised God anyway. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. He praised God anyway. 
and acknowledged his greatness. Look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Please, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps the covenant and faithfulness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive to your eyes and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, the great and awesome God. Nehemiah praises God and acknowledges his greatness. Second, Nehemiah confessed sins. He confessed the sins of the nation as well as his own sins. I am praying before you now, day and night, on, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have committed against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. And then finally, he petitioned God for his divine help. Listen to this section of scripture. It's a little bit longer. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Remember, please, the, the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote, remote parts of the heaven, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chosen to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Please, Lord, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name. Are we willing to do what Nehemiah did? Are we willing first to praise God and acknowledge his greatness? Second, are we willing to confess sins? They may be such things as pride, arrogance, selfishness, dot, 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 many other things. Are we willing to petition God for forgiveness and for help? Nehemiah was a praying man. Now, the big picture of God's plan for the church includes prayer. You know, I don't think I've ever talked to a Christian toward the end of his or her, her life who said, you know, I wish I hadn't prayed so much. In fact, most of us are willing to confess, I don't need to pray less, I need to pray more. Right? I think that's true for most of us. That, that we, we want to be in tune with God. And we want to acknowledge his presence and be in prayer. And so Paul gives these instructions to Timothy. He says, I urge them, first of all, not second, not third, not last. This is a priority. I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald, which is a preacher, and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. That was Paul's ministry. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Now, before we get into the text itself, let's go over some reminders about the nature of prayer. I've got four listed. I'm sure there are others that you can talk about as well. But first, let's remember that prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not a performance. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, 
they have received their reward in full. Their reward is the recognition of people, not pleasing God. Now, when I read those words, I'm reminded of the parable that Jesus told over in Luke chapter 18. And uh, it's not on the screen, so if you want to turn there, you're probably familiar with this. Luke chapter 18, it's the account of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And in the Gospel of Luke, by the way, there's a lot of teaching on prayer. And this is just one example. In Luke chapter 18, verse 9, the Bible says, He, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. I don't want to be in that camp. And I know you don't either. We don't, be, we don't want to be in that group of people. So he told this parable. He's contrasting the sincerity, of, the sincerity of two people. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now you're familiar with the Pharisees. They were the religious elite. They were the well-educated folks. They had all the answers to everything. And you're probably familiar with tax, tax collectors, too, at that time. Um, people didn't like them because they were taking money to give to the Roman government, and uh, oftentimes they took more than they should have. You know the story. Anyway, two different men, two different backgrounds. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I think, look at the number of times he uses uh, the word I. God... I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, give tithes of all that I get. So he was up there bragging about how great he was and basically saying, Lord, you're just lucky to have me on your team. Aren't I amazing? Now I've got a bottom that says, or standing, prayed, to himself. He wasn't even praying to God. He was just bragging about all of his accomplishments. And so let's pick up in verse 13 where it says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Short, succinct, to the point, prayers can be long, that's okay. Prayers can be medium length, that's okay. And prayers can be short. And this perhaps is one of the shortest prayers we read about in Scripture. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Can we say it together? God be merciful to me, a sinner. Some of you didn't say it. Let's try that again. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus continues, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So let's remember that prayer is not a performance. Second, do not limit the power of prayer to a time and place. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 through 18 states, rejoice always, and these are commands, no matter what's going on in your life, the Bible commands us, rejoice always, pray continually, that's another command. Remember that you're in God's presence and he wants to hear from you. Give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks to God in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So don't limit the power of prayer to a time and place. Third, do not use prayer as a substitute for action. James says, faith without works is dead. Prayer is a support for all our actions. We pray and we act based on faith. Fourth, prayer is not a last resort. I urge them, first of all, this is a priority. Prayer is a priority. Oh, back up. I want one, two, two minutes. Okay. And then, what are we to do? Well, we're to pray. And in this first verse of 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, we discover four terms that help us to understand 
prayer. I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. First, petitions. What does that mean? Well, that has to do with entreaties, requests, supplications, needs. I would say that prayer begins with a sense of our inadequacy, confusion even, uncertainty. So if you're confused, that's okay. If you're uncertain about where life is taking you, that's okay. Pray and, and let your petitions be known to God. Prayer begins with a sense of our own inadequacy. So we must recognize our need for the Lord. The second word that's used is prayers. This has to do with prayer centering on God and striving to understand and accept his perspective of things. And there's a difference between my perspective and God's perspective. Too often, we look at things from the human standpoint, and we don't see the big picture of how God is working in our lives. Let's remember this, that God is not a divine bellhop providing the service that we demand. He will answer our prayers. Third word that's used is intercession. This word pictures someone entering a king's presence to submit a special request. I like that. We're entering the throne room of God to make a special request. And we're given permission to make our requests known to God. And then fourth, this word thanksgiving simply has to do with the opposite of grumbling and complaining. Did you know that people that are thankful, that have an attitude of gratitude, are healthier in every way? Physically, emotionally, mentally, you name it. People that are grateful for all of God's blessings are just happier people. So thank God for all his blessings. One person said, prayer involves coming to God with all our needs, spiritual and physical, and thanking him for all the ways he meets them. Or as the song says, count your many blessings, name them one by one. I would sing it, but Jerry and Bruce are better singers than I am. For whom are we to pray? We're to pray for all people. Paul says, for all people, for kings and all those in authority. The fact is, the church has always prayed for leaders. Pray for them whether they're decadent or decent. But you don't understand, this guy that's in power right now, is a, he's, yeah, I know. But you know, the early Christians could have said, Nero, Emperor Nero, I mean, most of the Roman emperors, they were really nasty. I mean, that's an understatement. They were sick. They were, oh, beyond, I mean, they were just, most of them were just awful. And many of them persecuted the early Christians. And what does Paul say? Pray for all people, for kings, for the emperor, all those in, who are in positions of authority. Pray for people you like, but especially pray for people that are difficult. All right? That's what we need to do. That's, that's the attitude we need to have. And I like what 1 Peter 2, verse 17 says. It, it, it helps us to understand the attitude we need to have. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now let's talk about another praying man. His name was Daniel in the Old Testament. Now you know a lot about Daniel, but in Daniel chapter 6, we read that Daniel was described as a man with no corruption. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Wow. What a description of a man who is above reproach. But others got je jealous, and so they developed a plan to destroy him. Daniel. No fair. You're right. That is no fair. But when you're trying to do the right thing anyway, there are going to be people that are going to be jealous and they might try to destroy you. These administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god 
for a human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown in the lion's den. Notice how they appeal to the king's ego. They flatter him. You're so great, we think everybody should pray to you and you alone. So issue a decree and state, and state that. So what did Daniel do? You know what Daniel did. Daniel did what he always does. He prayed. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. He gave thanks to God. He probably prayed for the king. He likely prayed for the wicked men behind this uh, ugly scheme. He prayed to be faithful no matter what. He did what he always did. He prayed. And we need to do the same. Pray. Why pray? Well, Paul tells Timothy that we as Christians may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That's the goal. That we will live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And there's a reason for that. The reason is, Paul tells us in just a little bit, is so that the gospel can be shared with others. Literally, this verse could be translated that we may keep on leading a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. And so 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 through 4 shows us the benefit in praise to God. This is good, living peaceful and quiet lives. This is good and pleases God our Savior. God wants all people to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. You see, when we're living peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness, it helps to promote the gospel. And that's what it's all about. God wants all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Why pray? Because it's good, it pleases God. God wants all to be saved. God wants all to come to a knowledge of the truth. How should we pray? Through Christ Jesus, the one mediator between God and man. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. We pray in the name of Jesus. Uh, everything we do is to be done in the name of Jesus. And whatever you do in order to eat, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How should we pray? Paul says everywhere in holiness without anger or disputing. Therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So the prayer life of a faithful follower of Jesus is first, it's everywhere, it's constant, pray continually. You can even pray when you're driving, just don't close your eyes. But, you, but be in prayer. Acknowledge God's presence and be talking to him. Be in communication with him. Second, holy, pure lives apart from sin. That's what this terminology, lifting up holy hands, it has more to do with the personal life of living a holy life than it has to do with the posture. The posture is fine. We find many postures for prayer in Scripture. Lifting holy hands, standing, kneeling, they're all good. What's important is our heart, that our lives are holy and godly. And then third, without anger or disputing, we're, we are at peace with God and others because of Jesus. We are living what we might call a considerate lifestyle. There's additional instructions on prayer in 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter is talking to husbands, but he's emphasizing the importance of being considerate. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as a weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Husbands need to be considerate to their wives and all of us as Christians need to be considerate to others. So we have a clock here and we have a clock there. This is my last PowerPoint slide, Dustin. All right, here's some practical suggestions on prayer, some things to think about. And I'm sure you've got some others. If you want to share them with me after the worship assembly today, feel free to do that. I can add them to my notes and make this a better sermon. Uh, first, 
Just form the habit of prayer. Morning, noon, and night. Pray in the morning. Pray at the noon night. Pray in the evening. Pray all the time. You know that song. A friend of mine said, you know, I know there's this one religious group where they pray, I think, five times a day. And he said, I pray at least five times a day. And he wasn't praying. He's not a prayer. He said, I pray when I get up in the morning and thank God that I'm still alive. He's 73 years old. Uh, he's been clean and sober for about 40 years now. And he's thankful that he's able to live uh, a clean and sober life. And he helps people by taking them to meetings. And that's his ministry in life is to help others get clean and sober. He says, I pray in the morning and I thank God that I'm alive. I pray at noon, I pray before I eat my breakfast, and then I pray before I eat my lunch, and I pray before I eat my dinner, and I always pray before I go to sleep at night. So he has formed the habit of prayer. Pray without ceasing. Second, set no limit. Pray about everything. And I know some of you are thinking, Preacher, you don't understand. There's some stuff going in my life. I've been praying about it for so long. I don't know if God's listening to me. God is listening. God cares. We sing that song. Does Jesus care? Yes, he cares. So don't set any limits. Pray about everything. And third, along with that, do not let anything get in the way. God desires to hear from his children. Bruce is going to come up now and lead us in prayer. And then after the prayer, Bruce will extend the invitation at that time. So uh, let's determine to be individuals who pray. And let's be a church that prays. <clears throat> so let's, let's stand together. So I want to offer the invitation and then the prayer and then the song right after the prayer. Now it's our tradition to, to, to offer an invitation uh, publicly as we meet together as a congregation to, uh, to see if there's any needs that we might want to pray for, to physically meet and, and to spiritually be involved with as well. So if you have, if you have a need for that, uh, please come forward uh, here in a little bit after we, uh, when we begin to sing. Also, if you would like to put Christ on in baptism, clothing yourself with Christ,